Hi, I'm Annie Fenn. I am a physician and a chef and the founder of the Brain Health Kitchen. And welcome to my workshop. We're gonna be talking about the four Fs of brain healthy food. Just wanna make sure, just give me another raise of hands so everyone can hear me and see me okay. Everything's good, okay, great. It's nice to see you all. Hi, Bonnie, I see you out there in the audience. We're still getting people joining. Let me give you just one more minute before we get started. I'm gonna be going back in between um, some items in my pantry that we're gonna be talking about. And I also have a few slides prepared for you. All right, hi, Susan, nice to see you. Great, so you might be wondering what the four Fs of brain healthy food are. <laughs> so brain healthy food, unlike other types of things, it doesn't have any designation. Like there's no certified organic stamp for brain healthy food, right? And so I don't like to assume that everyone just knows what it is when they see it. Um, of course, you might know that, you know, berries are brain healthy. You know, that's like an obvious choice. They're pretty famous. Or avocados are brain healthy. But we're going to break it down into some different categories of why these foods are so good for your brain and how you can use food to protect your brain from the inflammation and the other types of things that happen with aging that can lead to dementia and Alzheimer's later in life. That's, what the, that's why I came up with the four Fs, to make it a simple process for everyone. Hi, everybody. I see we're still gaining a few people. I'm going to give you a couple more minutes to gather. Now, throughout the talk, you can leave questions in the chat, and um, I'll, I'll be try to check it periodically. We'll leave a few minutes at the end for questions as well. All right. The workshops have begun. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm going to introduce myself again for the newcomers. My name is Dr. Annie Fenn. I'm a physician and I'm a chef, and I founded a cooking school called the Brain Health Kitchen. And I founded the Brain Health Kitchen to teach people how to, how to eat delicious food while protecting their brains from dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, around the time I founded the Brain Health Kitchen, around 2015, we were getting a lot of data out of the medical literature that showed that certain dietary patterns could actually protect your brain from aging, protect the deposition of amyloid protein on the brain, protect you from neuroinflammation or inflammation in the brain that could lead to an environment that is more welcoming to dementias and Alzheimer's. So the Brain Health Kitchen is the only cooking school of its kind that focuses specifically and uniquely on preventing Alzheimer's and dementia. And I write about this often. I travel all over the place to give cooking classes. And I'm really happy to be here with you today in AHFC. So our topic today is the four Fs of brain healthy food. Now, like I was saying uh, before everybody got here, the four Fs is something that I came up with because, you know, not everyone knows what a brain healthy food is. And there's a lot of confusion out there as well. So I came up with the four Fs just to make it easier for you to spot a food that's good for your brain, a food that has been proven to prevent Alzheimer's and other types of dementia and help you help your brain age better. Um, and you might have read that brain foods are trending now um, in the New York Times. It was it was written that, you know, a lot of the food companies are including certain nutrients or ingredients and marketing them to you to be brain healthy. And I think that's all really great. I think that means that eating for brain health is really coming of age. But I also think you have to be, you know, buyer beware because food companies are often trying to sell you food so that they can make money. And a lot of times these foods may have a few ingredients that are considered brain healthy, but the food itself is not. So you're gonna be way smarter than anyone else after this workshop. You can be able to, be able to pick a brain healthy food every time. Um, I have a slide I want to share with you. Here's the four Fs. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is fats, brain-friendly fats. And this is a picture of roasted salmon. It's actually a great um, example of a very brain healthy dish because it has vegetables, it has beans, 
it has um, citrus, it has avocado over here, but let's talk about the fats in this dish. Now, um, people tend to think of fats as being either really good for you or really bad for you, right? They seem to be the bad fats um, in our dietary system, they tend to be vilified, you know, like that fat's bad or that fat's good. So I'd like you to think about fat, not so much as being good or bad, but being on a spectrum of some are better for your brain than others. Some are unequivocally good for your brain. Others you should probably limit or avoid, but I don't think you need to vilify them at all. Um, at the very bottom of the spectrum, the the fats that I want you to limit and avoid as much as you can, those are the man-made fats. These are called trans fats, okay? So trans fats are being eliminated from our food supply in the US. Um, it's the type of fat that is hydrogenated. It's made in fast foods. There's a lot of restaurants use trans fats because they're inexpensive and they're very shelf stable. It's in a lot of processed foods. Um, so these trans fats have been weeded out of, the, of our food system. We still have to be aware. A lot of times if you go out uh, in certain restaurants, they may be using really unhealthy fats. The reason these fats are damaging to the brain is they create a lot of inflammation at the cellular level, especially neuroinflammation, the type of inflammation we want to avoid for, for a healthy aging. Now, the next um, type of fat is saturated fat. Now, saturated fat has also been vilified for good reason. Saturated fat is responsible for elevating blood cholesterol in some people. Um, it can be increase your risk of heart disease. There are studies that show that you know, there's a direct correlation between the amount of saturated fat in your diet and your risk of getting Alzheimer's later. So that's really important information for you to know in terms of choosing the fats that you cook with. Um, saturated fat is more abundant in things like coconut oil, which is almost 90% saturated fat. And I don't consider it a brain healthy fat at all. Um, it's also common in dairy products like butter and cheese. It's also common in red meat. You know, you might think of saturated fat as the fat that you cut off your meat. There's actually fat inside the meat as well. Now, a brain healthy diet is not low fat at all. You know, we know from decades ago when hordes of people in the U.S. went on low fat diets, that that was not really good for health, cardiovascular or brain health. Um, the he brain healthy diet is actually about 40%. Um, dietary fat, but it's more on the other end of the spectrum. It's less than 5% saturated fat, and it's mostly mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. So where do you get these fats? So monounsaturated fatty acids, you get those from olive oil um, as a cooking oil, and it's recommended in the Mediterranean diet, as well as the MIND diet, which is a diet that was created specifically to reduce um, Alzheimer's risk in people. It's a spin-off of the Mediterranean diet, and they recommend using olive oil primarily in all of your cooking. Now, I do that for almost 90% of my cooking. If I have high heat cooking that I need to do, like sauteing something in a pan over medium high heat, or let's say I'm stir frying vegetables, I'll use something like avocado oil, which is also rich in monounsaturated fats. Um, the other fats that are high in monounsaturated fats are the pecan oils and other types of nut oils, which are very perishable. And I usually keep those in the refrigerator. Now, when it comes to your cooking oils, you don't really need a lot of cooking oils in your kitchen. You just need a good everyday olive oil, maybe a nicer olive oil that you can use to dress salads. And then you need either an avocado or nut oil for high heat cooking. And you know, oil is a high calorie food, obviously. So you wanna use it sparingly. You don't need to be consuming gobs of cooking oil. That's not what I mean by keeping these fats in your diet, but the fats that you do use to make your food, you know, delicious and, and taste better, you definitely will want to, you know, choose from these groups. Now, where else do you get monounsaturated fats? Well, you get them from avocados. You know, avocados are um, considered very brain healthy, right? You'll see why they pretty much fall into every of these food groups. Um, you also get them from nuts, like pistachios are rich in monounsaturated fats. Um, almonds are rich in monounsaturated fats. I do a lot of cooking with nuts in the brain health kitchen. Instead of using dairy products that are high in saturated fat, I might make a nut milk from almond milk or cashew milk. And sometimes I just buy it at the store and use this for all of my cooking instead of uh, you know, typical cow's milk or something else. And the other food that's really good, high in monounsaturated fats is seeds. 
you know, like, I don't know if you've cooked with hemp seeds, hemp seeds are wonderful. Um, chia seeds are also um, rich in these, in these healthy fats. Um, so just think of the, the fats in your diet. It's more of a spectrum. You need fats to cook with. It's what makes food satiating. Or it's what makes it delicious. And these nutrients, these monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats are actually really good for you. And your brain needs them. There's one category of polyunsaturated fats that your brain can't make itself. That's why they're called essential fatty acids. These are the omega-3 fatty acids. And where do you get those? You get them in that salmon and you get them in other types of um, like anchovies, uh, mackerel is another good source, herring, halibut, wild caught salmon. These are excellent sources of fats in your diet. I saw a few questions in the chat. Does anybody have any questions before we go on? Looks like we're good. So brain friendly fats. You want to get it from fish, seafood, avocados, nuts, olive oil. Okay. Our next category, our second F is fiber. So fiber is, is not a very popular thing to talk about, right? I mean, everyone knows that we're supposed to be getting a lot of fiber, but it's just not one of those things that's incredibly um, popular for people to eat a lot of. But fiber is extremely important. And, you know, why is that? Fiber is basically a magical ingredient in food that does so many things for both your metabolic health, which reduces your risk of getting diabetes, which goes hand in hand with Alzheimer's, and also your brain health. So there's indirect effects of fiber in the food, as well as direct effects. So when you consume a food that's rich in fiber, say this, this is a, a fully loaded tofu dish that I created. It's on a bed of greens. Um, the tofu is rich in fiber. All those greens and the nuts on top, all of those foods have fiber in them. When you eat a, a meal that's rich in fiber, what you're doing is you're providing a soluble matrix to go through your system. And what that matrix does is it binds up harmful blood cholesterol. So if you have a blood cholesterol problem, like your low density lipoprotein cholesterol, the bad one is elevated, fiber actually binds that up. And so it's no longer in the circulatory system. Um, you've probably read that having elevated cholesterol is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, and it's true. Um, having diabetes is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, and it's true. So fiber can indirectly help your brain health by reducing your risk of both of those problems. The other thing that fiber does for you is you've probably read about gut health being really important in terms of having a healthy brain, and this is an area that's exploding in medicine right now. And it's really important to cultivate a large variety of different types of microbes that live in your gut. And they primarily, they live throughout your gut, but the ones in the lower intestine, like the very bottom of your GI tract, those are the ones that don't tend to get enough fiber. Um, most Americans don't get the 25 to 35 grams of fiber that they need. So when you eat a fiber rich meal, like a bowl of oatmeal or um, an apple or an orange or things of that sort. When you eat something that's rich in fiber, what you're doing is you're supplying food directly to the lower intestine and it feeds those microbes. And what does that do for you? Well, they do a lot of things. Um, they create neurotransmitters for one, so they actually can help with your mental health. And these neurotransmitters go right across the blood brain barrier to your brain. They also create a class of compounds called short chain fatty acids. And these are incredibly anti-inflammatory. So I think of these gut microbes as making all these really important nutrients and neurotransmitters that go directly back up to your brain to cultivate your brain health. So that's one reason why fiber is so important. The other thing about fiber is that it's a conduit. Like it delivers nutrients to different parts of your body. Um, the next class that we, we're gonna talk about is flavonoids. And I like to think of fiber as just completely delivering these nutrients right where your body needs them and getting them back up to the brain. So how do you get 25 to 35 grams of fiber in your diet? It's not that hard. Um, the foods that are highest in fiber are the ones that are, for example, whole grains. So you want your whole grain bread instead of white bread. You want to choose, when you're eating rice, you want to choose rice that has some color. Um, colorful rice, like this wild rice, which is actually a seed. Um, or brown rice, or purple rice, which is also called black rice or forbidden rice. Um, all of these colorful 
types of whole grain rices are way better for you than white rice, um, which can stimulate your blood sugar to go up and your insulin. Um, when you choose pasta, which we eat a lot of in my family, I always go for whole grain and, you know, try a couple different brands to see how, you know, which ones you like best. Another really fiber rich food is beans. And my pantry is full of cans of beans. Um, you don't have to buy, make everything from scratch and your food doesn't have to be super expensive. Um, canned beans are just as good for you as the ones that you might cook up from scratch, like these garbanzo beans. And I do both, I cook them from scratch, I, I use them from a can. When I buy canned beans, I try to get a low sodium uh, brand um, and I also like to get an organic brand. I think it's, it's, it's better for beans. It doesn't really cost much more than the non-organic brands. So beans are a super high fiber way to get all that food in. Apples, you know, one apple has about five grams of fiber. Avocados, one avocado has about six grams of fiber. So if you choose about four or five fiber rich foods throughout the day, you'll get up to that 25 to 35 grams a day in no time. And um, the easiest way to get in the fiber is don't count fiber grams. I mean, I don't count the number of grams of fiber in the foods that I eat. Um, it's just too tedious. Um, but you could keep track of how many plants you eat throughout the week. Uh, studies show that if you eat more than 30 different types of plant foods throughout the week, then you're probably gonna get enough fiber that you need. You're probably going to get a good mix of nutrients too for your brain health. So it's more than 30 different types of plants a week. Um, start on Sunday, start counting, and chances are within a few days, you'll be up to 30. And it's also something to work on. It's a really good thing for, for kids to work on too. So our next F is flavonoids. And I wonder if everyone has heard of flavonoids now. I feel like this past year is the year of flavonoids. We've had some really uh, interesting papers come out. It's really exciting research about what flavonoids are. So flavonoids are basically the plant pigments that you see in foods. It's what makes raspberries red. It's what makes apples red. Or it's what makes blueberries black. It's what makes this uh, delicata squash yellow and orange. And dietitians have been telling us forever to eat the rainbow. And why is this important for brain health? because the flavonoids, the things that make foods colorful, are actual brain health nutrients. And this paper out of the journal Neurology from last year showed that there are specific foods that have uh, certain, certain types of these flavonoids that can reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease. In this study, they looked at some of the most flavonoid-rich foods. They included kale, beans, green tea. The green in the green tea is, um, is full of flavonoids. Uh, squash, broccoli, apples, um, pears, tomatoes, oranges, berries, grapes. These are some of the most flavonoid rich foods in the study. What they showed was that when they look at a population of healthy people who don't have dementia, those who ate more of the flavonoid rich foods, they were able to reduce their risk of Alzheimer's after five years by as much as 50%, which is, which is really outrageous. 50% reduction in the people that ate more flavonoids in their food. And you don't have to really do anything specific to get more flavonoids. When you go to the grocery store, just look for colorful foods, okay? Look for foods that are colorful and eat a wide variety of the different colors. You also get flavonoids in leafy greens. So I like to buy several boxes of um, like spinach, arugula, whatever kind of, you know, greens that look good at the grocery store. And I try to eat through those boxes throughout the week. That's a, a really good way to do it. Um, and one more slide for you here. These are all the different foods that were shown to be um, highest in flavonoids. And it's important when you're eating for brain health to just choose the foods that you really like. Like start with the things that you like, that you know how to cook, that are easy and go from there. And then you can branch out and try to try new foods, different foods, diversify your diet, get more plants into your diet, all the brain protected dietary patterns that we know, um, they're mostly plant rich, not a hundred percent, but they, but they can be, they can be completely plant-based, but there are many different types of brain protective diets, like the Mediterranean diet, the mind diet. Now there's the green Mediterranean diet, um, things of that sort. But the most important thing is find the foods that you like, choose lots of colors, make sure you get plenty of fiber 
and make sure you ha your, have your eye peeled for different types of colors at the grocery store. Now, the fourth F I want to talk to you about is fit. And I think fit is maybe the most important one. Um, like I might be telling you here that it's really important for you to eat a lot of pistachios and a lot of chia seeds and a lot of quinoa. But if you don't like those foods or they don't fit with your budget or they don't fit with your lifestyle, then um, that's not a brain healthy choice for you. So what I mean by fit is not everyone has to fit into the same um, food pyramid. Um, over here on the left in the slide, we have the Mediterranean diet, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. It's, um, you know, there's been tons of studies, dozens and dozens of studies that came out of the Mediterranean countries showing that the way they eat there reduces the risk of not just cardiovascular diseases, but also dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, people who eat a Mediterranean style diet, they have less cognitive decline as they age. They perform better on memory tests. Um, all of these things are super important. So epidemiologists have been analyzing the Mediterranean diet for decades to see what is it in this diet that is so brain healthy. Um, but you don't have to be from the Mediterranean or eat a copycat of the Mediterranean diet. Um, what I mean by fit is there are other dietary patterns that might make more sense for you. For example, there's an Asian American pyramid, food pyramid here on the left. And you can see that it's also mostly a plant-based diet. It's a lot like the Mediterranean diet, but there's just different foods there. There may be different vegetables that make more sense to you based on what you grew up eating, um, what your ancestors ate. Maybe you know people that grow food like this. Um, it's also rich in seafood and nuts and lots of other whole foods that we've been talking about. Um, another important dietary pattern is the African-American heritage diet. And like, just like the other diets in the Mediterranean one, this might make more sense for you. The, these may be the foods you reach for that will translate into making meals that have are a good fit for your lifestyle. Um, the Latin American heritage diet is the same. There are lots of heritage foods in the Latin American diet that are brain healthy. So I think when you're thinking about these heritage diets, it's important to go back a couple of generations maybe, maybe your parents didn't cook this way, but I bet your grandparents did or your great grandparents did. I mean, when I think about the uh, traditional diet in my family, my parent, my father and my grandparents were from Sicily. And when my grandmother moved to the US, she started cooking more of a standard American diet, which was very unhealthy. And, um, but the diet that she, the foods that she cooked with back in Sicily were very good for you. Um, and they probably would have lived way past their hundreds if they had stuck to that diet. So that's why I think fit is, is so important when it comes to brain health. You want to choose the right foods, but you also want to choose the, the foods that are delicious to you that make a lot of sense. So as a recap, our four brain healthy foods, brain friendly fats, fiber, flavanols, and fit. And, you know, you can see, you can test any brain healthy food you want and see if it fits into this pattern. So you can see why avocados are such a brain health superstar. They kind of have it all, um, if you like them. I don't know if I've met anyone who doesn't really like an avocado, but I'm sure someone is out there. <laughs> but it's got monounsaturated fats. It's got a whopping like five to seven grams of fiber, depending on the size of the avocado. Um, you know, the you know, that bright green part of the flesh that's right next to the skin, that's super rich in flavanols. So when you eat your avocado, just make sure you scrape the skin really well and to get that part out. Um, and it's really easy to, to cook with. You can mash it up, you can put it on your toast, you can dice it and put it in your salad. Uh, you can put it on top of fish, smear it onto a tortilla. There's a million ways you can, you can cook an avocado. Let's think of another food that is, has all four Fs. Do the berries have all four Fs? Berries are super rich in fiber. One cup of fresh berries is about five grams of fiber. That's a, that's a ton. Um, they don't really have any fat in them, but they are packed with flavanols. In fact, the Mind Diet recommends you eat at least one half cup of berries twice a week. And that's for Alzheimer's risk reduction. I recommend eating berries every day because there are other studies that show they can help improve your memory if you eat at least a half to one cup per day. So berries are pretty much a slim dunk. Um, leafy greens. When it comes to leafy greens, they have brain-friendly fats, they have tons of fiber, they have flavanols, and unless you really, really, really don't like greens, I would imagine that they would fit into pretty much everyone's diet. I think we are 
we have a few more minutes. Uh, does anyone want to throw out some questions about the brain friendly fats or anything else in the presentation? I mean, one of the most important things about cooking for brain health is it doesn't have to be expensive and doesn't have to be difficult. You know, a lot of these foods I just buy at my regular grocery store. I don't buy everything organic, although, you know, if you want to, you can, but there are a lot of foods I don't buy organic. I try to buy my berries organic because they're very porous and they can absorb pesticide residue. But a lot of the things that I'm going to be peeling anyway, like an avocado, I don't purchase organic, um, like a banana. Um, I do like to buy canned beans organic, but you can look at your food budget and decide which, which things really need to go in the organic pool because that can make it more expensive. The other thing I really like is to lean heavily on convenience foods. And I don't mean junky convenience foods. I don't mean processed food. Um, what I mean is like, it's winter here where I live in Wyoming. And it's, I'm not getting very good berries, but I like to go to the grocery store and get a big bag of wild blueberries. The wild blueberries are even more rich in these flavonoids than the regular blueberries because they're smaller and they've got more skin, more skin to flesh ratio. So I always have some frozen berries. Um, this could be a generic brand. It could be organic or not, whatever you feel like you want to buy. Um, I also like to buy, if I can't buy fresh greens, sometimes the greens just don't look that great in the winter at my grocery stores. So I'll buy a big bag of frozen kale or frozen spinach, and I'll take it right from the freezer by the handful and put it into my soups and my stews and things like that. Or I'll saute it in a pan and put it into a sandwich uh, or do all sorts of things with it. Um, another really great convenience food that's brain healthy is certain types of salsa, especially green salsas made with tomatillo and peppers. Those are super brain healthy vegetables. And you just have to check the label and make sure there's not a, a lot of added sugar or a lot of added ingredients. It should just be mostly vegetables, onions, garlic, things like that. Another great convenience food is tomato sauce. And tomato sauce, uh, some of them are not very good for you when you start reading the labels, but um, as long as there's no added sugar and no junky ingredients like sunflower oil or soybean oil, things like that, if it's just tomatoes, garlic, and spices, then that's gonna be a really good convenience food for you that you can do tons of things with and get dinner on the table super quick. All right, I think I saw some questions. I'm gonna go pop up into the chat and see. There are questions in the general chat room, got it. Ah, here we are. Was that pecan or walnut oil? This is pecan oil. And walnut oil is also great. It's a little bit more expensive. I don't buy it so much. Uh, this is 100% virgin pecan oil. And it's super high in monounsaturated fatty acids, like I said. And it's also the only oil I've found that also has polyphenols in it, which is similar to olive oil. What oil do you use when baking? I mostly use extra virgin olive oil. And I've adapted most of my recipes to use olive oil instead of butter. And the more, the more you can use olive oil, which is a monounsaturated fat, for something that's full of saturated fat like butter or lard or um, you know cheeses or something like that, um, then you're changing the ratio of monounsaturated fats in your diet to saturated fat. Brain healthy diet is very high in monounsaturated fats, very low in saturated fat, which is not to say you can never have butter, you can never have cheese. Um, I eat those things very sparingly, but I'm mostly baking with olive oil. And if you want some recipes, you can go to my, my website, brainhealthkitchen.com and take a look at how I do it. You can adapt your recipes the same way. Hooray for wrapping old ways. Yeah, those are the pyramids that we show. Where did you get those ethnic food pyramids? We're talking about the ethnic food pyramids from old ways. So old ways is the organization that brought the Mediterranean diet to life. They created the Mediterranean diet pyramid cartoon that we see all over the place. And they're also helping raise awareness now about these other traditional diets I'm very much in favor of. I don't think everyone has to fit into, you know, a Mediterranean Caucasian style diet to be brain healthy. Absolutely. Okay, I'll address the elephant, sugar. Yeah, you know, you notice I didn't know I didn't say that a brain healthy diet has any kind of sugar in it. But of course, we want to make sure that we don't have a lot of sugar in our diet because diabetes is 
linked to Alzheimer's risk. Not only if you if you have type 2 diabetes, your risk of Alzheimer's is increased, but if you have borderline diabetes, which is just an elevated blood sugar when you've been tested at the doctor's office, that also increases your risk. So fiber in a roundabout way is a way of lowering the sugar in your diet because if you're eating a lot of fiber rich foods like steel cut oats, like beans, like whole grain pasta, um, it's going to burn much more slowly. Any of the sugars in your diet is going to burn through more slowly. Um, so I use very small amounts of sugar in my cooking and my baking. I use natural forms like maple syrup, honey, things like that. But I really do use them sparingly and always, always with fiber. Like my cookies have a ton of fiber. My cakes have a ton of fiber. You get the picture. That's a good question. How do you feel about smoothies as a way to get more greens, berries into the diet? If you love smoothies, go for it. Um, I would want you to also get some of them in the whole food form too, though, um, because you know when you kind of break down the fiber in these berries in the blender, your body doesn't have to work as hard to do it. And they may not make it all the way down to the lower intestine where we want to feed those, those hungry gut microbes so that they can in turn create neurotransmitters and um, short chain fatty acids for your brain. So I would just mix it up. I know some people don't really like to eat salads at all and that's fine. Um, but you can, you'll get all the nutrients in your smoothie, but you might not, not get the whole benefit of the food if you're always blending it up. Is ghee not a good option for cooking? So I would put ghee in the same category as butter. Ghee is mostly saturated fat and it has the solids, the milk solids, um, just filtered out. So ghee is super high in saturated fat, just like coconut oil. I only use it every once in a while if I need it for a dish for a certain flavor. Um, sometimes I'll rub it on a roasted chicken because roasting chicken sometimes can be at a higher heat and I, I don't want it to burn and ghee has a high smoke point. And sometimes I'll use it if I'm making a Indian style meal and the recipe calls for it, but I don't use ghee on a regular basis. And it's, it's I don't consider it a, a brain healthy food in particular. I consider it one of those foods you should probably limit. Uh, we had a couple more here. Stevia sweetener, okay. Okay, that's a great question. Um, Stevia is probably fine. It's a natural, it comes from a natural plant, you know, like a leaf that they, they dry and then they turn it into a powder. Um, it does not seem to spike the blood sugar like, like cane sugar does, um, and therefore it doesn't elicit much of an insulin response either. But there's honestly just not a lot of studies on Stevia. Um, monk fruit sweetener, I would put in the same category. It's very reassuring that you can sweeten your cookies or your cakes or whatever else, your oatmeal with monk fruit sweetener. Um, it doesn't seem to, to spike your blood sugar or your insulin, but we don't really have a lot of studies on it. But I am dabbling in some of those artificial or natural sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners we know are detrimental to brain health. Those are things that are put in a lot of diet sodas um, and a lot of processed and packaged foods. I would definitely avoid artificial sweeteners and things that have high amounts of sugar, especially drinks. Those are definitely um, been shown to increase the risk of not only dementia, but stroke. Is it, is, let's see, stevia. What about a gluten-free pasta? Oh, you know, there's, there's a brand I like when I was, I wrote a cookbook this year and I have a gluten-free lasagna. Um, so I tested a lot of different brands. I like Jovial. Jovial is a brown rice pasta. They have lots of different types of pasta, but I thought that was the one that, that held up the most to cooking or baking has a nice chewy texture, never gets gummy. Um, so I would say that's my top brand. I also like some of the lentil based pastas uh, and some of the chickpea pastas, but I'm not gluten-free. So I can't say that I've, I've eaten a ton of those or cooked with a lot of those. Yeah, it's a good question. Let's see, these are great questions, you guys. Let me see if I missed any up at the beginning. All right, well, I think we're pretty much out of time. And I think, thank you for joining me. For more information, you can go to my website, brainhealthkitchen.com. I also have a free newsletter that you can sign up for there. And every month I send you recipes. I talk about what's going on in the brain health world that you might want to know about. And, um, and I write, I'm also off frequently on Instagram, uh, sharing tidbits of food and brain health information. So thanks for, thanks for being such a great audience and all the wonderful questions. Really appreciate it.